Uh, first, our first presenter is Associate Professor Raymond Chan, who is currently an NHMRC Professional Research Fellow at um, Queensland University of Technology and Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. He's also president of the Cancer Nurses Society of Australia. He obviously isn't very busy. Um, and, uh, and the CNSA is the peak professional body representing over a thousand cancer nurses in Australia. Raymond's research interests include cancer survivorship care, management of distressing symptoms in cancer patients and palliative care. So I'm sure he'll be able to contribute a lot to today's discussion. So please welcome um, Raymond. Thank you, Joanne, for the very kind um, introduction. And um, first of all, I would just like to thank the organising committee for uh, inviting me here today. It's, it's truly an honour to be uh, in such a um, diverse crowd of professionals who are truly interested about, about integrated care. Um, I do not take this topic lightly. Um, I think a lot of time when we talk about integration or integrated care, we sort of um, take it for granted that isn't that supposed to be happening anyway but today I just thought that I would um, give you an overview of um, of um, of how I really see um, integrated care is possible uh, from a cancer care clinicians perspective as Joanne has mentioned I hold a conjoint appointment between the university and um, and a tertiary cancer center so although uh, some of the examples that I'm going to use is going to come from the acute care setting uh, but it's, it's, it's really um, um, taking a step back um, to look at what, what do we really need to do if we truly want to see integrated care. Now, I know that Kim has um, done a little uh, uh, hands up of, of where, uh, what your background might be, but can I also ask how many of you here from acute care setting? And how many of you here are from primary care setting? And how many of you are NIDA? Good. Okay. Well, that's good. That helps me a little bit to know um, to know about your background. Um, today, what I would like to um, talk about is what do we know so far about cancer survivorship? What is our capacity to address some of the issues of cancer survivors? And what does integrate, integrated care look like um, for cancer patients? And, and we're going to talk to you about some of the work that we have been doing in this space as well. So what do we know about, about cancer survivorship? I remember being, um, when I was a student nurse um, 16 years ago, I was sitting in a conference and the theme was uh, cancer survivorship. And I remember zooming out because I was like, well, these people are surviving. What are they complaining about? What, what are the issues? Why do we need to talk about them? We need to talk about how we're going to save lives. How can we improve our chemotherapy in a way that they can live longer? Um, and it's interesting that today now I'm devoting my whole career <laughs> um, and even at night dialing in to teleconferences with people in the state to talk about how can we better coordinate our survivorship care? How can we better give care to these patients so that they can have long-term um, good outcomes? But when we are referring to cancer survivors, we're really talking about people who have finished treatment. Now that doesn't mean that they have no other issues to be worried about. And uh, for my PhD, I was looking at uh, um, surveying patients about what they do to self-manage their fatigue. And these people have metastases, uh, cancer spread into another part of their body, and most of these people is, are in incurable. Um, what really, really amazes me from that experience of surveying over 150 patients with advanced cancer is that nowadays... Um, a few years after my PhD now, when I go back downstairs, walking past the waiting room, they are still alive. They are still having their issues to sort out. They're still having a number of health needs that need to be addressed. We know that the number of cancer survivors is increasing because we are treating them much better. We are, we are having an aging population. And so, and so we know that cancer is, uh, um, is a disease of the aged. So, so accordingly, we will also have um, increasing cancer incidence as well. And these people are living longer and longer. This chart um, is from Cancer Australia. But I think what you can see there 
is that over the years, over the years, cancer cancer incidence has really been increasing, and we are projecting uh, many more cancers we're going to see into the future uh, to, to to 2020. Now, from 1982 to 2010, uh, in mere a period of 18 years, um, those of you who have got teenage kids, you would probably realize that 18 years go really, really fast. Um, within 18 years, we see an increase of survival around 30%. So we are treating cancer better and better now. When we look at uh, prostate cancer, some of our patients don't die from prostate cancer anymore. They die with can uh, prostate cancer and die of another disease, for example. So we do have a, a high number of population out there living with cancer. What we also know about these people is that they have a high level of, uh, of health and support needs, and certainly cancer is increasingly a chronic illness. This uh, research done by, uh, done by a UK group told us that around 50%, uh, up to 50% of patients having the fear of recurrence after they get treated by cancer. But what we also know is that, is that patients just don't have the fear. It's also complicated by their fatigue, by their pain, by their depression, and by their anxiety. And being the clinician, looking at your patient, you always think about which one is the chicken and which one is the egg. If I kill the pain, is the patient gonna be free from de depressive symptoms? If I kill the fear of recurrence, if I give people the strategies, are they gonna have less anxiety, for example? And so it is really complex when we look at uh, the needs of our cancer survivors. This is one of the uh, systematic reviews that we have done with our Hong Kong colleagues from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. We look at 37 studies um, over a, a 10, 10 year period. Um, we look at 4,000 patients. And here are some of the things that we found in terms of the quality of life 12 months down the track after they finished treatment. Now we saw that the physical health has certainly declined over the, past, over the 12 months um, post-treatment. Interestingly, we've seen that the emotional well-being has improved. Now, it's, uh, I would just like to highlight that when we were comparing, we were really comparing the baseline when we see the patients when they get diagnosed compared to 12 months uh, afterwards. Just because the figures are telling us that they have improved over time, over that 12 months, that doesn't mean that they have returned to their pre-morbid level of well-being. Um, and, and that's certainly something that we're very, very... Um, very aware about. When we look at social and well, um, social and role and cognitive functioning, uh, they're varying uh, results telling us that, well, maybe they have, maybe some of, some of the patients would improve and maybe some won't. So it is highly important that we look at the patient as an individual and address the need that they have. Now this go a little bit more detail into, um, into some of the symptoms when we look at all these studies. What we see is that um, all this, symptoms seems to have improved over, over the 12 months, but patients uh, still have a number of issues um, facing them at 12 months. And some of them um, could be fatigue, some of them could have issue about their appearance, being treated for head and neck cancer, for example. Uh, Ken is a gentleman that I saw in 2014 as part of a trial, a part of a randomized central trial that we have done. We, we were really, really interested in looking at how can we coordinate care in such a way that patients could have better outcome afterwards. So he had, net, had a neck cancer squamous cell, squamous cell carcinoma at the right tongue in 2002. He had a recurrence in 2014. We treated him with uh, surgery uh, and chemo radiation in 2015. So being, being an academic clinician, um, knowing that this could be some of the common, compl uh, common complaints of our patients, I now have an hour of opportunity to spend with the patients. I'm not sure how confident I am just with that one hour, I'm going to be able to help ensure the patients are going to get coordinated care the patient is going to get integrated care. What is going to happen after one hour, after this patient step out of our cancer center? So I would like to come back to Ken a little bit later on at the end of my, of my presentation. What about our capacity to respond to healthcare needs? I have done a, a study, and this is my research team, uh, with 119 
acute care cancer nurses um, at the Royal Brisbane and Women Hospital. We asked them um, about their attitude, about where that they think that this uh, list of tasks or care uh, should be their role. And, and I know that some of you are trying to you know, look through uh, some of the fine details, but I'd just like to highlight to you it looks like this bar chart is telling us that the majority, you know, researchers are good at that. We say that the majority of nurses think that because it's about 50%. Um, over 50% of nurses consistently think that all these things that we think are survivorship care standards should be delivered to the care, to, to the patients. But what I would ha like to highlight to you is when you look at some of these items here, conducting distress screening, um, discussing fertility issues, communicating survivorship um, care provided with primary care givers. When you look at um, this particular one here, only 30 something, um, only 60% uh, of, of nurses think that it is their role. What about the rest of the 38%? What if they actually don't do it? You know, for those of you who are here sitting, uh, sitting here who work in primary care, where are you going to get that information from? And sometimes I hear our primary care colleagues complaining that um, they don't get enough information from the cancer centre. And um, I'm not exaggerating. I actually have outpatient nurses in the acute cancer centre complaining that they do not get enough handover and information from the inpatient care nurses. So when we are looking at coordinated care, what are we really talking about? What are the attitudes that we really need to address? And I think having an opportunity to come together um, uh, at, at a forum like this to talk about our standards is clearly very, very important. I also went on to ask them what they are confident and not confident um, in doing, and some of the least confidence items are um, discussing potential post-treatment fertility issues, um, discussing financial and employment issues and referring to the appropriate supports, and also conducting distress screening. And, and indeed, for one of the... Um, when I looked through the, the qualitative comments, some nurses did come back and ask me, what is distress screening? Now... Um, there is a lot of work that we need to do to be able to empower uh, nurses or other health professionals so that we can in turn empower our patients. So what does integrated care look like? Being a man of integrity, um, I went on to Wikipedia, I went on to do what I asked my students not to do, especially my PhD students. Um, and it tells me some of the buzzwords here, um, it's really about comprehensive care. It is about seamless care. It's about coordinated care. And on a serious note, this is, um, this is a, a model put out by COSA, um, the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia. And I, I, once again, I apologize for this busy uh, chart, but what you can see here is that it is extremely complex for us to be able to know where exactly the patients sit in their disease trajectory, what do they need, when do they need them, and who should be seeing them. And some of the work that we have been really trying to do is to be able to risk stratify patients and to really assess their needs so that, so that we are really addressing them accordingly. And what you can see here is if they have low risk, we should really support self-management and we should really be referring them back to the community to receive community support and, uh, and primary care support as well. And of course, if they do have uh, moderate or high risk, we need to think about other strategies in terms of how we, um, we organize their care. Um, some of the principles that we really want to highlight for integrated care is to place the, survivor, the survivor's need at the center of healthcare. It's not about what we think are important, it's about what they think are important. It's so frequently um, seen that you would have you would have our medical oncologist seeing a patient thinking that pain is necessarily the, the highest uh, need or the concern of the patients. But a lot of the time when you go and talk to the patient, the patient is like, don't worry about my need, uh, my pain. I really want you to sort out my social stuff. I want you to help me uh, with my social stuff. So that, that is really important that, that 
whatever needs that we perceive patients to have is indeed patient-centered. We need to facilitate communication between all healthcare professionals. Now, looking at back, looking back at that survey, if nurses don't think that it is their role, who would do it? I don't know. Get survivors to the right services at the right time. Ensure regular review of survivors' needs and ensure appropriate follow-up for cancer recurrence and late effects. Um, a group in Western Australia uh, has done this particular review looking at models of care for blood cancer survivors. And um, these are the number of models that we arrive at when we went out to look at the literature and see what is actually available. But where, where, does, where does our primary care professionals sit in these places? What we know is that a lot of oncologists and, and hematologists, they don't want to let go. They want the patients to keep coming to see them. Looking at those incidents, how can we cope in acute care if we don't let go? How can we better work with our colleagues in the community in addressing the needs of our patients? You see a few words of GP up there. What about the practice nurses? What are their role? What are their role in, in providing care to cancer patients? Now I would like to go back to Can. This is, um, this is at the end. Of, of his treatment. Before I went to see the patients, I had an opportunity to review all the notes. I created a treatment summary uh, so that the patient can bring back to the GP. But what I could really see is all the biomedical stuff. I can read the blood results. I can see the CT scan. What else can I see? Sometimes people write down that they have got a supportive GP. Do you just take it as, as face value? Or does it, is it really that the GP is supportive? I don't know. Um, but really, before I, I could go on to see the patient, I have minimal information. So I know all these. I know that patients uh, potentially could, um, could have these issues, but the patient was not concerned about any of the other uh, physical symptoms that I thought they would be worried about. They complain about two things. The first thing is uh, insufficient cash flow. He applied for pension but got rejected. And the second thing is fatigue. That really, really concerned him. So what I have done for that patient in that limited time of one hour, I created a treatment summary um, so that the patient could bring back to the GP. I gave him a lot of information. Um, we, we talk about information sharing or information giving a lot, um, but, but they do need to be evidence-based as much as possible. I gave him a health professional contact list um, so he knows how to contact um, his oncologist, his GP or whatnot. We've also got a care plan whereby we set really specific goals uh, using motivational interviewing. Uh, what are you going to do next? When are you going to see the social worker um, about this? For example, how many times are you going to do exercise if this is what you like to do? Um, going back to this slide here, looking back, um, Looking back at my confidence level <laughs> as a nurse, I asked my nurses in my cancer center how confident they are in being able to provide good care to patients. When I take a step back to look at what should really be, be given, what care should really be given to patients, I'm not sure whether that one hour has made an impact. I hope that it did. So I don't know what your role might be. Your role might be a practice nurse. Your role might be a specialist nurse. You might be an allied health uh, person. You might be a care coordinator. How many of you are from Queensland? We're going to have a number of uh, nurse navigators um, coming through into the system. What would be their role? What would we perceive their role to be? How much power or how much, how much work or um, empowerment are we going to give to them? Um, it is important that we ask ourselves what would be our role for these patients. This is a randomized control trial that we, are, that we have uh, recently uh, completed. Um, previously, it was mentioned that there are a lot of resources um, coming out from the PHN. I get an email here and there uh, nearly every week telling us that there's $35 million of innovation fund coming from Queensland Health. Uh, PHN sending us emails saying that we're giving out $1.5 million yesterday. <laughs> um, they will tell you to put in your application within, within the next week, for example, and then they would just form a little panel and just say, we're going to fund this, we're not going to fund that. What I really wanted to highlight here as an academic is that I think 
we all here have the responsibility to demonstrate outcomes and to provide evidence. And I've seen it far too often whereby um, new models of care is introduced, but because there is no outcomes, there's no evidence. Um, so when the resources dry up, they are gone. Uh, so it is very important when we are looking at nurse, nurse navigators, for example, what evidence are we going to have? Who are the patients that they are seeing? We need to establish that to be able to justify why we need such a workforce and where we are we are investing our, our money. Other than that particular trial, uh, I'm also leading a trial uh, in hematology survivors. And uh, we've, we also work with Professor Deborah, Deborah Anderson in Queensland, uh, looking at how we do similar work for women wellness uh, after cancer as well. So at the end, I would just like to acknowledge my mentor, Professor Patsy Yates, and also Cancer Australia for a couple of their slides. Thank you, and I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you, Raymond, for your presentation. My name's Julie Sharrick. I'm a mental health nurse consultant in a general hospital. Um, my question, I just wanted to clarify, did you say when you're talking about these navigators, which I think I would know as nursing uh, cancer care coordinators in my hospital, um, are you saying that you will be um, developing some evidence or some doing some research in that area or, or there has been done research in that area? Because I'm interested to know whether there is evidence for cancer care coordinators uh, at this point. Yes, uh, our group has recently conducted a systematic review on cancer care coordinators. It is, uh, the, the evidence is certainly really, really scarce. Uh, for cancer care, because now that we have got that experience in cancer care, we have introduced cancer care coordinators probably around a decade or more ago. Um, because we didn't really define them very well, it's because we didn't really prospectively evaluate it really well. A lot of these care coordinators, some of them has turned to become a doctor's nurse in a clinic. Um, everyone turned out to have different roles. Um, and we run into, as as nurses continue to specialise um, in different ways, we run, we, we have a risk. Um, so I can tell you now that it's very little evidence out there telling us about um, about the role of nurse coordinators or nurse navigators. We are currently doing another systematic review on nurse navigators. Um, there are some evidence out there, not too much, but in Queensland we are also looking in ways to evaluate uh, nurse navigators' um, contribution as well. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Carmody, John Carmody. I'm in Hi, private uh, practice in Sydney Hi, John. and it's an ethical problem really it's a, and it's a real one. I've, this, this, this actually happened. I had a patient who decided he didn't want to be treated and... Um, he just, uh, he, he decided he did, didn't want to tell any, anybody. He wanted to sell up, give it to his kids and his grandkids. And um, the ethics of that, I, I mean, uh, um, I, I think that um, I, I actually, uh, um, 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 honoured his request. But I didn't sleep for a couple of nights, you know. <laughs> so uh, what would you do? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. And I think a lot of the time as, as, as clinicians or as health professionals, we go back home, we were like, you know, did we do the right thing? Did I make use of the time that I spent with the patient? Is it actually really them who's choosing what is for their life? And, and I think we run into really, really complicated situations in, in cancer where people have had their first line treatment and they want to decline second line or third line because of the experience that they had, but you still need to offer them. Um, for myself, uh, my personal ethic tell me that I would like to honour the patient's wish, wish as much as possible, but that doesn't mean that we stop care from that point of time on. Uh, we could still care for them so that they can have the best quality of life possible. I'm sorry, I don't think I've answered your question. 
Um, yeah, Jeff Fuller here from Flinders again. It'll be interesting to hear what Julie Sharrock's got to say about that sort of thing uh, this afternoon because it seems to me we're often in a situation where we have an ethical dilemma and if you have to go home and live with it without talking to anyone, that's a pretty not, not a good situation to be in. So I guess that issue of clinical supervision. But it wasn't what I was going to ask, Raymond. Um, some very good work, so con congratulations. Sure. Um, in terms of the care coordinator, uh, I've been involved with some people for a number of years looking at the whole notion of care coordination. Um, and yes, nurses you know, can do it pretty well, but it doesn't have to actually exclusively be nurses. And what we found from a systematic review was that um, a coordinator, uh, the essential skills of a coordinator was someone who had um, skills in working in a team um, and who had some clinical knowledge. So some clinical knowledge was useful, but also a teamwork orientation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And I'd also like to highlight to, uh, to the audience that a recent, uh, a recent uh, critical paper has been published in, on, uh, in Collegian uh, by Anne McMurray on Nurse Navigators that talks about, um, that speculate about the differences between care coordinators, nurse navigators and case managers. So that is an interesting article to look at. Um, hi, my name's Drew Nichols. I'm actually in mental health. But the question I'm talking about, because over the last couple of years I have actually nursed family members um, palliatively with cancer things, and I honestly found the system, so I think the nurse navigators will be a great help. We had great service in the hospitals. Um, each time they were terminal, so the hospital said, well, now it's time for you to go home, but they weren't well enough, uh, weren't unwell enough yet to go to palliative care. So we were in sort of limbo. I took time off work and nursed them. And when they got really sick, because there was sort of different areas, we had to go to different hospitals. Even though I'm a nurse and a mental health nurse, it was horrendous. We had support from blue nurses who were great. There was different times where we had different emergencies and I called the health line or I called a private doctor and they would say, go back to your other hospital. I phoned the hospital and told them exactly what was going on because they were great with medications and all that, but there was just different instances. And they're going, no, you're discharged now. You have to go to the ED department of our wherever we were. And I, I looked after three different people and it was a continuing saga. And we had to go through everything again because ED departments do not understand oncology treatments. They didn't know the medications and they didn't know what to do. I used to take a bag full of drugs with me because quite often they didn't have the drugs there. And it was so nurse <laughs> navigated as far as I'm concerned and continuous seamless care would be awesome for people to come in, you know, in the care for, for oncology patients. Mm. And that's only just recent. Mm. It's only just recently that's happened. So I'm very interested in palliative care. And even when we were actually in a palliative care unit, we were, I had to fight hard to say we're not going home because I could not manage the person at home. And we just had to fight and say, no, we're staying. And, I mean, sort of as things where they let us stay. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly... Um, how I thought it, you know, like sort of end of life would be in, in palliative care. Thank you for the comment. I think there's one question. We've got time for one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, Adam Johnson, Consumers Health Forum. Hi, Adam. Uh, going back to the uh, case of Ken, uh, you certainly spoke about the information you gave him on a clinical or medical basis. But one of his key concerns was that he was declined uh, a pension. What what advice were you able to give him directly on that or referrals? Hmm. It's, it's a very interesting question because if I were to rate myself on my confidence level again, probably that would be the part that I would. But uh, remember what I've asked nurses is to discuss about it. Not necessarily being a nurse, it doesn't mean that we are experts of everything. Um, so being able to initiate that, um, that discussion with the patient, um, I saw my role much more about uh, being a coach. Uh, the patient actually already knew that there are resources out there that he could actually go and talk to for people at Centrelink. 
Uh, for example, there is another social worker that we can actually refer him to. Um, but actually getting the patient articulate that, knowing what his plan is at the next step um, and asking him to hold himself accountable. When are you going to, to talk to this person? Uh, that really, really helps. So at that point of time, I must say that what I had is the information that I have in the booklet. Um, I don't have a great deal of knowledge about, about getting his pension, but um, I think helping patients set goals uh, is a very key, key role uh, of nurses. Um, Rose Mohiggins, health psychologist and doing other things as well. Um, I work in palliative care as well as in um, other areas. And what's really striking me when I'm hearing our conversation is, and also hearing from nurses, you know, struggling with some of the difficult decisions and difficult work to support patients, is that need for a multidisciplinary approach. And it's really knowing when to refer on to the social work. That's obviously you know, a referral and that, that will be activated by social worker or when to discuss clients within a multidisciplinary team. If we have options of having a multidisciplinary case conference for clients where we are having any emotional reactions or any stress or having difficulty in managing either their, um, what they're doing or what, how we're responding, to me that means we need a bit more multidisciplinary team and that'll help us get a bit more reflective in our practice and possibly some more supervision. So they're my thoughts around that. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your presentation. Thanks. Um, just before...